everybody, and welcome to the second uh, monthly clinical meeting of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Uh, so for the month of February, we are having the monthly clinical meeting in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of Hematologists. We would like to welcome you all and also thank the college for this collaboration and holding the second monthly clinical meeting with us. So without further ado, uh, let's move on with the monthly clinical meeting uh, proceedings. So uh, I would like to welcome our speakers for today, uh, Dr. Vajira Gamage, Dr. Vasanthi Vikramasinghe, and Dr. Utpala Nethi Kumar. Uh, today's monthly clinical meeting is on navigating the spectrum of bleeding disorders. First, we have um, case, case presentations and discussions by two of the speakers. And finally, we will have um, a journey through the blood cells, a hematologic quiz. So the first speaker for the day is uh, Dr. Vasanthi Vikramasinghe, consultant clinical hematologist, teaching hospital Mahamodara. I'd like to invite you. To... I'm Dr. Vasant Victor Singh, and I'm going to look at my projects at Teaching Hospital Mark. So for this forum, we selected the topic of bleeding disorders. And I think it's an important topic because the clinical presentation of patients with bleeding problems could be quite variable, and the initial encounter of this patient could be with any of us. Therefore, it's important that all of us have a good understanding of suspecting a significant clinical bleeding issue problem. And also uh, to do further reference. So the patient I'm going to discuss today is a 34-year-old lady who was referred to hematologic clinic a few weeks ago from the antenatal clinic. She was in her third pregnancy at 16 weeks of DOA. So she was referred for further assessment and management of known bleeding disorder. So her initial presentation runs back to year 2003 when she was around 13 years of age. She had admitted to hospital with heavy menstrual bleeding. This had been a few months after taking menarche. She hasn't had any other medical illnesses and had not been on any other medication. Her parents had been non consanguineous and she had been the fourth child of the family with three elder siblings who are healthy and no family history of bleeding disorders. On examination, apart from being pale, the rest of the examination has been normal. Since this functional uterine bleeding and menorrhagia is quite common around this age group, this had not been given much significance, but managed symptomatically with tranexamic acid and iron replacement. However, within the next few months, she has had several hospital admissions with menorrhagia and anemic symptoms, which has warranted few red cell transfusions as well, together with tranexamic acid. And also, on further inquiry, she has admitted that she had been experiencing on and off gum bleeding also since childhood. So this had prompted further evaluation and a hematology referral at that point. So how do we evaluate a patient for a bleeding disorder? History is the most important tool in uh, determining the probability of a bleeding disorder. There are certain important points in the history uh, such as the onset of symptoms. It's important to know whether the onset was from childhood or whether it's an adult onset uh, disease. Childhood onset bleeding problems may indicate an inherited cause of bleeding disorder. And also the duration of symptoms and whether bleeding was spontaneous or provoked. Spontaneous bleeding may point towards a severe sort of bleeding. Type of bleeding is also important. Uh, especially whether the bleeding was only mucosal or visceral, or whether the patient has had both sorts of bleeding. Mucosal bleeding only is mostly seen with platelet disorders and vessel wall problems, whereas visceral bleeds like hematrosis and uh, muscle bleeds, etc., can be seen in clotting factor deficient. Severity of the bleeding problem is also important, and also how the patient had faced previous hemostatic challenge. 
The medical history is important, especially with regards to diseases which are associated with hemostatic dysfunctions like liver disease, renal disease, malignancies, thyroid disease, etc. And also the medication the patient is on, uh, medication like antiplatelets, antiplatelets, and also other over-the-counter medication the patient might be on, and herbal and Ayurvedic medication, which can interfere with hemostatic tests. Family history is important, and if the family history is suggestive of a familial cause, we can look into the inheritance pattern as well. So how do we know whether a bleeding is significant? Because bleeding symptoms could be subjective from person to person and also to the assessing physician. What I consider as a bleed might not sound significant to another person. Therefore, is there a method of uniform bleeding assessment? So in this regard, there are few bleeding assessment tools developed, and one such tool which is widely used is the ISTH basket, that is the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis Bleeding Assessment Tool. So this includes 14 categories of bleeding. And you are given a score for each category according to the severity and frequency of bleeding. For an example, if you take menorrhagia, you are given a score of 0 to 4 according to the severity of bleeding. Likewise, for each category, you are given a score and the total is added. And uh, if you are a man and you have a score of four or more, or if you are a woman and you have a score of six or more, that's considered abnormal, which warrants further evaluation. So the higher score for the females is because they face more hemostatic challenges throughout life than like pregnancy and menstruation. For children, a score of three or more is considered abnormal. This score also has some for example, it's relatively insensitive to children and also to acquired breathing disorders. However, keeping those caveats in mind, we should try to use these bleeding assessment tools whenever we evaluate a patient for bleeding. So coming back to the patient. So her presentation had been with menorrhagia and gum bleeding. So what are the possible causes for this? Broadly thinking, we can think of local or structural causes and hemostatic dysfunction. So she had been uh, evaluated by the gynecology team extensively, and they have uh, assessed her, and uh, gynecological assessment had been normal. And also, she's had a dental assessment and excluded local oral cavity problems, which could give rise to dental uh, gum bleed. So what, then we are left with the hemostatic dysfunction. This is mainly for the benefit of the trainees. We all know that hemostasis is comprised of primary hemostasis and secondary hemostasis. When a vascular injury occurs, the first thing which occurs is vasoconstriction, and then the platelets uh, come into play and they interact with bone factor and the exposed subendothelial collagen, and they uh, form a platelet plug. This is known as primary hemostasis. The clotting cascade comes into the play after that, and they form a fibrin clot. And this is strengthened by factor 30 and gives rise to a stable fibrin clot. Finally, the fibrinolytic pathway takes over and degrades the clot. Therefore, if it's in any of these steps, this will volatility, the number and function of platelets, quantity and quality of blood factors, or fibrinolytic pathway defects can give rise to bleeding problems. So how do we do further laboratory assessment? Should always be guided by history and examination. So going back to the patient's initial presentation, her full blood count had shown hypochromic microcytic anemia with normal vitamin count, thrombocytopenia with the platelets around 80 to 100 with raised MPV, mean platelet volume, meaning there are large platelets. So the blood picture had confirmed hypochromic microcytic anemia with features of iron deficiency and macrothrombocytopenia. Liver, renal, bone profiles as well as thyroid profile had been normal. Serum ferritin had been low as expected with the bleeding. Abdominal scan had been normal. And the initial clotting screen with PT, APTP, thrombin time, and house fibrillation had all been normal. This had been repeated and confirmed. So what are the causes of a bleeding problem with normal clotting screen? So this is a popular uh, data interpretation question in human biology, and I assume in other specialties as well. 
So I will uh, concentrate more on conditions associated with norm, reading conditions associated with normal traffic train and the next speaker will touch upon the other areas. So the common causes for bleeding with normal trotting strain are disorders of plate function or number, factor 13 deficiency, mild bone movement disease, mild trotting factor deficiencies, vascular disorders, disorders of fibrinolysis, and certain medication. So how do we differentiate between each other? For plate function disorders, as screening, we can do bleeding time and PFK. And for confirmation, like transmission echocometry, flow cytometry, nucleotide assays, and genetic tests, and uh, such investigations can be done. For factor 13 deficiency, blood solubility test is considered a screening test. However, it's relatively insensitive to mild uh, factor 13 deficiency. So the confirmatory test would be factor 13 assay. One milligram disease can be uh, excluded by doing one milligram strain with antigen activity and factor deficiencies can be confirmed with factor acid. So for this patient at diagnosis, the bleeding time had been more than 10 days, which is prolonged. Blood solubility test had been negative, and one different screen had been completely normal. So a few words about bleeding time, because we get a lot of requests asking to get bleeding time tests done. It's a screening method for primary hemostasis, but you all should understand it's uh, subjected to a large number of variables and perform a bias. So uh, it's very difficult to standardize the skin part for the blogging. Think, therefore, it has poor sensitivity, poor reproducibility, and poor, it's a poor predictor of bleeding risk. And also, we can't do it on patients with thrombocytopenia. We need a platelet count of at least 100 to do this, do this test. Therefore, it's largely discredited and replaced by other tests. In the rest of the world, but because we don't have the other tests, we still do bleeding time, but we should be mindful of all the limitations of that. So, PF100 is a screening test for disorders of primary hemostasis. It simulates the in vivo function of platelets in primary hemostasis. So, what actually happens is a citrated whole blood is aspirated through high shear stress uh, through a disposable cartridge which has an aperture. Within a membrane, uh, the membrane is coated with agonist collagen ADP or collagen adrenaline. So when the blood passes through this aperture, the platelets will get adhered and activated and will form a platelet aggregate. This will lead to closure of the aperture. So the time taken to the closure of the aperture is measured. Light transmission aggregometry is considered the gold standard for evaluating platelet function. So if I'm to explain the principle very simply, you have a sample of platelet-rich plasma of the patient, and you transmit a light through the sample and at various agonists. So when the agonists are added, if the platelets are functioning properly, they would get activated and will form platelet aggregates. So the sample would become more clear and more light would be transmitted through the sample. And this would be detected by a photodetector. On the other hand, if platelet aggregates are not formed, the sample would be turned and more light would be absorbed to the sample and the transmission would be missed. This also shows the same thing. So classically, you get a biphasic aggregation factor, the primary wave and a secondary wave. Primary wave reflects the response to the addition of exogenous agonists, and the secondary wave reflects the secretion of endogenous agonists after wavelength activation. So there are strong agonists and weak agonists, and they can be used in various concentrations as well. So according to the type of agonist and the concentration you use, there would be a classical pattern of waveforms. And depending on the plate function defect you have, there are characteristic uh, light transmission aggregometry patterns. So this patient also has had a light transmission aggregometry done 20 years ago from MRI, however, she doesn't have the report with her now. This is a similar report from MRI. So this shows normal response with ADP, low dose and high dose, arachidonic acid and collagen, but absent response with restricity. So what is restricity? It's a glycopeptide antibiotic that causes one milligram factor to bind to plate with like protein 1B receptor. 
Therefore, an absent response to toxicity with normal response to other agonists could happen in two conditions. One, a defect in the 1B different factor. Two, defects in platelet like protein 1B receptor. An inherited cause for this would be burnout sickness, etc. cetera. Uh, and also, to differentiate between these two, we can do light transmission aggregometry mixing with normal plasma, just like we do 50-50 um, mixing for prolonged PT or APTT, we can also do light transmission with mixing, for example, with normal test. So if there is a deficiency of one different factor, adding normal plasma would replace one different factor and there would be a correction of light transmission agribometry. However, this patient hasn't had any correction and also her one different assay was normal. Therefore, a diagnosis of Bernard Soulier syndrome has been made. So what happens in Bernard Soulier syndrome is there is a defect in the platelet like protein 1B95 complex, which is the principal site in mediating interaction of platelets with one different factor. Therefore, there would be impaired primary hemostatic response leading to bleeding. It's an autosomal recessive condition, and characteristically, they have giant platelets with mild to moderate thrombocytopenia. The reason for this is most likely because this glycoprotein complex is located in the platelet site of center, giving rise to structural changes leading to large platelets. And also, it's essential for the production of platelets from megakaryocytes, leading to thrombocytopenia in this condition. So it's important to differentiate bernard Soulier syndrome from other causes of macrothrombocytopenia and also from ITP to avoid inappropriate therapies. ITP, which is a common condition, can also present with, with similar features, bleeding and large platelets. However, it's always a diagnosis of explosion. And also, we all know that we don't see much bleeding with ITP when the platelets are more than 50 or so. Uh, other confirmatory <coughs> platelets also are looking for the absence of platelet like protein 1B or genetic test. So how do we manage these patients? Uh, the definitive management might vary according to the precise diagnosis. However, the general principles of managing patients with inherited bleeding disorders are the same. So all patients should be registered at a hemophilia clinic, and they should be well educated about the condition, especially the lifestyle modifications, what to do and what not to do, and uh, about the importance of dental care, regular dental care, and also immunization against hepatitis C and the need for annual liver function tests because they are more prone to get blood and gut product constriction. Also, HLA typing should be done at diagnosis because they are more prone to develop HLA antibody. So few therapeutic agents which are used in these disorders are antifibrinolytic, like pranexamic acid, and also desmopressin, which is a synthetic vasopressin analog. Recombinant factor 7A can also be used in major bleeding situations. And platelet transfusions should be limited to high bleeding risk situations. That is because they can lead to alloignization and also other transfusion related side uh, And ideally, they should be given HLA matched platelets. Dental procedures and minor surgeries can usually be done under pranaxin as it covers starting pre procedure and continuing for a few days with additional local hemostatic method measures. And major surgeries always need communication between surgeons, the hemophilia center, and the transfusion services. Again, pranexamic can be given pre procedure and continuing for one to two weeks. And HLA matched data transfusions can be given immediately prior to the procedure and also uh, further transfusions according to the clinical need. For uncontrollable bleeding and massive bleeding, you can use recombinant factor 7 as well. So how do we manage pregnancy? It's important for this patient as well. So, as, uh, so there should be close collaboration between all the relevant teams, and there should be a detailed written management plan for delivery well before the expected date of delivery. And also there should be a management plan for the new. It's important to look for consanguinity between the patient and the partner, because if so, there is a risk of having an affected baby of this autosomal recessive condition. So the mode of delivery is according to the obstetric indication, and we can usually give HLA-matched platelets or 
uh, prior to the delivery or cesarean section, and also can consider recombinant factor 7 in certain situations. Panasonic, I said, can also, can, should also be used together with the other. Regional anesthesia should usually contraindicate in these conditions. And also, we should keep in mind that these patients are at risk of developing delayed postpartum hemorrhage. Therefore, they should be monitored and the panepsymic acid should be continued at least for two weeks. And another important thing is because uh, these mothers lack certain uh, the, the, like protein 1B, they can develop HPA platelet antibodies against these uh, ant antigens. And the neonate is at risk of developing neonatal alloyment thrombocytopenia. So what is the management for our patient? So she's currently 20 weeks pregnant and her first pregnancy had been a normal vaginal delivery and HLA match platelets have been given before the delivery. Second pregnancy has ended up in an emergency section due to obstetric indications. So it's not very clear whether the patient received HLA match platelets or random donor platelets at that point. Uh, and there's no consent to with the partner. At present, she doesn't have any bleeding symptoms and uh, still she has a and deficiency anemia with the hemoglobin of around 9. Her platelets are in the range of 50 to 60. The machine count usually comes around 30, which alarms all of us. But when we see a black picture, she has a lot of large platelets, and the count is more than 50 minutes of the time. So at the moment, she is on iron treatment, and also she's given a supply of tranexamic acid, which she can take at home. She develops any bleeding until she comes to the hospital. The plan is to deliver at term, most likely, she will have an elective section given the previous cesarean section, and the transfusion services are aware of her, and they will uh, arrange actually match platelets before delivery. We planning to give tranexamic acid and also planning to make recombinant factor 7 there available in case she has uncontrolled bleeding. So, the neonate logic team is also on the door. They will monitor the neonate for allergy from the cytopenia and planning to monitor for people and country plans in four to two weeks and keeping the stress that they can be fine for them. So in summary, bleeding disorders have considerable clinical and laboratory heterogeneity. Comprehensive history is the key to diagnosis of bleeding disorders. And it's all important that we use standardized bleeding assessment tools whenever we are evaluating the patient for bleeding. The investigations we do should be logical and structured to avoid unnecessary expensive investigations, but at the same time to avoid delays in diagnosis. So the investigations should not be interpreted in isolation, but should be repeated and confirmed and also interpreted together with the clinical context. And multidisciplinary collaboration is essential for effective management of patients with bleeding disorders. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for that enlightening uh, case presentation. So next up uh, is Dr. Vajira Gandhi, a consultant clinical hematologist from the teaching hospital Kara Pitiya. Uh, she will also be discussing on another case presentation. Afternoon, everybody. And let's move on to the second case presentation on the theme of bleeding disorders. So this is a patient that I encountered during my overseas training in UK. She was a 77-year-old lady with a background history of ischemic heart disease, hypertension, and morbid obesity. And she presented to the emergency department, sudden onset fatigue for one day duration and extensive bruising in both upper limbs for three days duration. She denied any constitutional symptoms and there was no significant past history or family history of bleeding. 
Her regular medications included low-dose aspirin, herbisartan, nicorantil, and bisoprolol. On examination, there was fallow, but no icterus. There were extensive circumferential bruising over the full length of upper limbs on both sides. Bruises over the submammary area was also noted, so as in the lower back. There was no palpable lymphadenopathy, no palpable masses or hepatitis B. Mm -hmm. Rest of the clinical examination was also unremarkable. So these are the results of initial blood tests performed in the emergency department. Here you can see in the full blood count, she was having a moderate anemia with hemoglobin of 6.9. There was a mild neutrophil leukocytosis and the platelet count was normal. They have performed a baseline plotting screening as she presented with bleeding. Here the prothrombin time was normal and the APT, you can see there is a marked prolongation in APT. It was 69.6 seconds, where the upper limit of normal was 30 seconds. Klaus fibrinogen level was normal, and serum creatinine was normal. Total bilirubins were elevated, liver transaminases were normal, and CRP was 33. So with these findings, she was referred to the hematologist for further evaluation. Since there was a significant prolongation of APTT, we went ahead with mixing studies for the APTT. So what we did was a 50 to 50 mixing of the patient's plasma with pooled normal plasma. The immediate mixing we steps treated a partial correction of the APTT. We also went ahead with an inhibitor screening, which included the 50 to 50 mixing for two hours at 37 degrees incubator. And after two hours, this patient's APTT was significantly prolonged and it was 78 seconds, denoting the presence of a time and temperature dependent inhibitor. In order to confirm the diagnosis, we performed fact assays. Here you can see the fact eight level is markedly low. It was 0.4 units per deciliter. Factor 9 and 11 levels were normal. Both 1 mg factor antigen and activity assays had normal results. Finally, we did uh, an inhibitor quantification assay, the Bethesda assay, which was strongly positive, which gave 88 Bethesda unit result. So in summary, this lady presented with recent onset significant bleeding. There was a time and temperature dependent inhibitor with markedly low factate levels and positive Bethesda acid. All these findings were in keeping with the presence of an acquired factor VIII inhibitor. In other words, she is having acquired hemophilia A. This is how we managed her initially. Since there was symptomatic anemia, we gave blood transfusions. The bleeding was controlled with bypassing agents. We used activated prothrombin complex concentrates, initially at a higher dose, 100 units per kilogram, 12 hourly. At the same time, tranexamic acid was started in full dose. In order to look for a possible secondary cause leading to the development of this acquired inhibitor, we performed further investigations. CT tap was normal, ANA was positive in speckled pattern, DSAD, DSDNA was negative, virology screening was negative, and there were no abnormal monoclonal proteins. We started her on immune suppressive therapy with high dose prednisolone, 80 mg daily. The activated PCC dose was reduced to 100 units per kilogram once daily after a couple of days. The response was assessed clinically and as well as by lab parameters, the hemoglobin value, the APTT and factate levels. We also started her on MMF, one gram twice daily dose. And we continued prednisolone high dose for a period of two weeks and it was tapered off while continuing MMF. She was discharged from the hematology ward once the hemoglobin was stable.
And this table summarizes how we assess her response using hematology tests. Here you can see about two weeks later, the APTD was coming down, even though it was still prolonged, and factate level was coming up, and beta was going down. About eight weeks later, APTT was completely normalized, and factate level was normal, and beta was very minimal at 0 0.4. We followed up her in the hematology clinic while continuing MM. And around 10 months later, we could identify the a like prolongation in the APTT again. And factor 8 level was going down, it was 32, and Bethesda theta was going up around 2.43. And these features were suggestive of the reappearance of the inhibitor. Therefore, at this point, we started her on intravenous rituximab and completed four cycles. Four weeks later, completing rituximab, her factate level was normalized and the testacid went down. Since she did not have any clinical bleeding, we decided to stop MMF and we followed up her in the bleeding disorder clinic. So now I will move on to the discussion part. So what is acquired hemophilia A? It is a rare bleeding disorder caused by immune-mediated depletion or inhibition of coagulation factor 8. It can occur in both men and women without a previous bleeding history. Most commonly seen in the elderly, however, there is a small peak seen in women of childbearing age. It's associated with autoimmune disorders such as SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, polymyalgia, pentagoid and inflammatory bowel disease. Also associated with malignancies, both hematological and non-hematological malignancies. Pregnancy and also drugs such as penicillin, sulfur drugs, phenytoin, methyl d In addition, certain anticoagulants and antiplatelets are also reported to be associated with this condition, leading to a delayed diagnosis. However, in 50% of cases, it is idiopathic with no clear association. Mortality is reported to be 8 to 42%. The diagnosis of acquired hemophilia A requires both clinical and laboratory findings. Patients present with late onset abnormal bleed. The bleeding pattern in the majority of cases are of subcutaneous bleeds. Bleeding can also see in retroperitoneal area, in the muscles, GI tract, and GU tract. In contrast to the bleeding pattern in congenital hemophilia A, in acquired hemophilia A, hematrosis are uncommon. Before moving on to the laboratory diagnosis part, I thought it's good to touch upon the normal coagulation a little bit. This is the secondary hemostatic, hemostatic uh, status, what happens inside our body when there is a vascular damage. The tissue factor in the vascular endothelium is being exposed to the coagulation factor 7 in the blood circulation. And factor 7 gets activated and form a complex with the tissue factor. And this has a very high affinity. And this tissue factor factor 7 complex is the initiation step of coagulation. It can directly activate the coagulation factor 10 into 10A, which leads to formation of thrombin from prothrombin. However, the amount of thrombin formed via this pathway is only trace amounts and is not sufficient enough to make adequate amount of fibrin leading to polymerized fibrin. Therefore, what happens is the formed thrombin via this pathway can activate a number of other coagulation factors, and this is called the amplification phase of coagulation. It can directly activate factor 11, leading to 11A, activate factor 8 into 8A, and also activate factor 5 into factor 5A. Factor 5A is the core factor for factor 10. So, with the exponential activation of this number of coagulation factors, there will be formation of large amount of thrombin, which leads to formation of fibrin from, from fibrinogen. This leads to formation of polymerized fibrin and a stable fibrin clot. So in our body, 
there is an initiation step for the coagulation, which is followed by the amplification phase. This is the traditional cascade system of coagulation, which all of us are aware of, where you have your intrinsic pathway, extrinsic pathway, and the final common pathway. The intrinsic pathway is initiated by the contact activators, and then from pre-caliprane into caliprane, factor 12, 12A, 11A, 9A, and 10A, finally thrombin and fibrinogen. Actually, this traditional concept of coagulation is not uh, actually what happens inside our body. However, it's an important tool for understanding and interpretation of the common coagulation tests performed in clinical practice. For example, the, from the APTT, we assess this intrinsic cascade of coagulation. For APTT, we add contact activators externally and assess the time taken to form the fibrin clot. For prothrombin time test, we add thromboplastin and tissue factor externally, which will activate factor 7, and at the end form the fibrin clot and assess the time taken for formation of fibrin clot. So what are the causes for APTT prolongation? A patient may present with bleeding and found to have an isolated APTT prolongation. These are the causes, the factor deficiencies related to the intrinsic cascade system of coagulation, factor 8 deficiency, factor 9 deficiency, factor 11 deficiency, or von Willebrand factor deficiency. And these deficiencies could be congenital deficiency or maybe an acquired deficiency due to the development of an inhibitor. Sometimes when the patient is on therapeutic dose unfractionated heparin, they can present with bleeding and isolated APTT prolongation. On the other hand, there will be patients who are found to have an isolated APTT prolongation, but they do not have any clinical bleeding. What are the causes for this? Lupus anticoagulant is the commonest cause. In addition, factor 12 deficiency and contact factor deficiencies are the causes for APTT prolongation without any bleed. If you can remember, the factor 12 and other contact factors do not contribute to the in vivo hemostasis, but they are contributing for the clot formation in the APTT test, the in vitro hemostasis. That's why the patients will have APTT prolongation, but no clinical bleed. And the commonest and the only cause for isolated PT prolongation is factor 7 deficiency, could be due to congenital or acquired deficiency. Some patients will present with prolonged PT and APTT both. This could be due to the deficiencies of coagulation factors of the common part. Factor 2 factor 10 and factor 5 deficiencies due to congenital or acquired causes. And there is another condition called combined factor 5 and 8 deficiency occurs due to genetic mutation. Acquired factors such as multiple clotting factor deficiencies seen with liver disease, vitamin K deficiency and warfarin treatment are also causes for prolonged PT and APT. Sometimes patients with lupus anticoagulant will have antiprothrombin antibodies and can give rise to prolongation of both APTT and PET. Coming back to our patient, she presented with a prolonged APTT and when there is a prolonged clotting test, what we do next is 50 to 50 mixing studies. There we take equal volume of patient's plasma and pooled normal plasma and mix them together. And if there is a correction of the prolonged test, it indicates there is a factor deficiency. And if there is no correction, it is due to an inhibitor. However, the factor inhibitors have unique feature. That is, they are time and temperature dependent. So they will need some time and temperature for their action to take place. Therefore, we need to proceed with an inhibitor screening test, which include a two-hour incubation step at 37 degrees. If the patients demonstrate a significantly prolonged APTT after two-hour incubation at 37 degrees, it indicates a time and temperature-dependent inhibitor, 
which is a unique feature associated with factate inhibitors. Actually, this test is very useful in the resource poor setting, like in our country, and sometimes because we do not have access for the factor eight assays urgently, but if your inhibitor screening is positive, indicating a time and temperature dependent inhibitor, then we can start treatment straight away. However, in the standard setting, we have to perform factate assay to confirm the diagnosis. Most of the time, factate assays are coagulation or APTT-based factate assays. Sometimes, because these conditions are autoimmune diseases, patients can be having coexisting lupus anticoagulant in addition to the factate inhibitors. In such situations, it can interfere with your factate assay. In such situations, chromogenic factate assays can be used instead of clot-based factate assays. This graph demonstrates the factate inhibitor kinetics. In the first graph, you can see the factate allo antibodies which develop in congenital hemophilia A and they demonstrate type 1 or linear kinetics. However, in contrast, the autoantibodies in acquired hemophilia A often display complex and nonlinear kinetics, also called type 2 kinetics. After confirming the diagnosis of inhibitor, we have to quantify the inhibitor. The commonest assay we use is the Bethes assay, which is a coagulation-based assay. However, as I told earlier, if there is a coexisting lupus anticoagulation, it can interfere with Bethes assay because Bethes is a coagulation-based assay. In such situations, you can use immunological assays such as ELISA to accurately quantify the inhibitor. I will move on to the management part of acquired hemophilia A. There are three main goals of management. Number one is treatment of bleeding. Number two, eradication of the inhibitor. And finally, identification and treatment of the underlying cause. One important thing about acquired hemophilia A is that there are no comparative clinical studies available, maybe due to the rarity of the condition. So the treatment decisions are often based on the clinical experience of the treating physicians. Therefore, expert advice is important in patient management. Treatment should be initiated for clinically relevant bleeding, irrespective of the inhibitor teeter or residual factor eight activity. We should avoid iatrogenic bleeding. Venipunctures and cannulations are kept to a minimum. Blood pressure cuff applications and blood sugar monitoring are performed only if clinically indicated. We should avoid intramuscular injections and we should keep in mind to avoid invasive procedures unless they are essential. <coughs> there are uh, various hemostatic agents recommended for the treatment of bleeding in acquired hemophilia A. However, efficacy of these hemostatic agents is unpredictable could be due to the complex kinetics of these inhibitors. None of these are universally effective. There are uh, two main types of agents recommended as first-line hemostatic agents in acquired hemophilia A. These include the bypassing agents and recombinant porcine factor eight. There are two main bypassing agents. One is FIBA, factor eight inhibitor bypassing agent also called activated prothrombin complex concentrate. The other bypassing agent is recombinant activated factor seven. Then the recombinant porcine factor eight, which is the trade name is Obiser, also approved as the first line hemostatic agents in acquired hemophilia A. Sometimes there is a place to use human factor eight in high doses with or without immunoabsorption. If your bypassing agents are not available or if there is no response to the bypassing agents and your inhibitor theta is low, then there is a place for high doses of factor eight. You can use tranexamic acid as an adjunct therapy. It's considered in all types of bleed except renal tract bleeding. However, there is no place for IVIG or desmopressin in the management of acquired hemophilia A. Little bit about the bypassing agents. These are called bypassing agents because 
they can achieve the hemostasis, they can form thrombi and then fibrin clot without using factor VIII. FIBA contains coagulation factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, and there is large amount of activated factor 7A in FIBA. This recombinant factor 7A is an activated form of factor 7 manufactured by a recombinant technology. As I told before, both these agents can boost from bean generation despite lack of activated factor 8A9A complex. These bypassing agents, either of them can be used as your first line treatment option. The choice mainly depends on the convenience of dosing, whether to use a plasma derived product or a recombinant product, or, and the cost, and of course, the availability. The initial dose for FIBA is 50 to 100 units per kilogram every 8 to 12 hours. However, the maximum dose has to be limited to 200 units per kilogram per day. In terms of recombinant factor 7A, the dose is 90 micrograms per kilogram. You have to give it every 2 to 3 hours because of the short half-life. After the initial bleed control, you can reduce the dose and frequency according to the individual response. Combined use of recombinant 7A and FIBA should be avoided, except in life or limb threatening bleeding unresponsive to each agent alone, because the incidence of thrombosis appears to be higher with the use of combined agents. Little bit about recombinant porcine factor 8 or obiser. It is approved by the NICE in UK and also the European countries and USA. The efficacy of this is based on the lack of cross-reactivity between the recombinant porcine factor 8 and coagulation factor 8 antibodies. One advantage is that we can directly measure the factor 8 level and titrate the dose accordingly because it's a type of factor 8. The initial therapeutic dose is 200 units per kilogram. And one other important thing is there are no reported thrombotic events with regard to recombinant porcine factor 8 in contrast to the bypassing agents. However, there is one limitation. You have to perform a test called baseline antiporcine factor 8 antibody teeter before starting this product. And the teeter has to be less than 20 beta units for you to start on this product. Unfortunately, we don't have access to this product in Sri Lanka. Eradication of inhibitors in acquired hemophilia A. We have to use immune suppressive treatment and we have to start them as soon as the diagnosis is made. The first line treatment would be either steroids alone or steroids in combination with the second line immune suppressive agent. According to the recent European guidelines, they recommend to give steroids alone if the patient's factate level is one or more and Bethesda teeter is 20 or less than 20. They recommend to give steroids in combination with rituximab or cytotoxic agent if the factate level is less than 1 or Bethesda teeter more than 20. If you can remember, our patient's factate level was 0.4 and she was having Bethesda Tita of 88, and we started her on both prednisolone and MNF at the beginning. Prednisolone high dose usually continues for four to six weeks because it's known that the median duration of response is around five weeks, and steroids can be tapered off gradually if the hemoglobin is stable and factor VIII level is rising. These are the options for second-line immune suppressive therapy. There are cytotoxic agents such as cyclophosphamide and LMF. You can use rituximab or cyclosporine. In some situations, you will need to start multiple immune suppressive agents in order to get an optimum response. How do we monitor the response to treatment? Response assessment can be mainly clinical with symptomatic improvement. We can use laboratory assays such as the APTT, factor VIII level, Bethesda assay, and the patient's hemoglobin level. Sometimes appropriate imaging studies would be useful to assess the hematoma size and etc. 
these patients need a longer follow-up, initially at least monthly for first six months, and then by a, like every two to three monthly up to 12 months, followed by every six monthly during the second year and beyond if possible, because of the autoimmune nature of these diseases, relapses can occur. And as these are acquired conditions and seen in elderly population, these patients might need to be started on antiplatelet agents or anticoagulants according to certain indications, such as ischemic heart disease, stroke, or atrial fibrillation. In such situations, you can initiate these agents once the factor VIII level is normalized. One other important thing with, with regard to the patients of acquired bleeding disorder is that if they are to undergo any invasive procedures in future, they will need a coagulation screening prior to any invasive procedure. And these are the references. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam, for that talk. And um, finally, now it's going to be a quiz. And uh, Dr. Utpala Nethikumara, lecturer, Department of Pathology and Forensic Medicine from the Faculty of Medicine, University of Morocco, will be conducting this session. Um, we encourage you to post your answers through the online chat. And also, if you have any other questions um, to be directed to any of the three speakers, please post them uh, towards the end of the um, chat, so towards the end of the meeting, so that uh, we can answer them all at the end. Um, for now, please uh, please uh, join us and uh, actively uh, hope we can actively answer our questions uh, on the quiz. Good afternoon. So thank you very much for the kind introduction. So let's start the hematologic case, uh, journey through blood cells. So this is a picture-based uh, quiz with uh, five options and uh, one single answer. So we'll start with the first case scenario. So this is a 30-year-old woman who presents with gradually worsening shortness of breath on exertion. And she has had menorrhagia for last three months, and examination is unremarkable except for pallor. So this is her full blood count. White cell count uh, is nine with neutrophil five point one, lymphocyte two point nine, and hemoglobin is seventy one. Red cell count two point four, hematocrit twenty two, MCV sixty nine point eight, MCH twenty point one, MCHC thirty, and RDW twenty with platelet count of. 550. So we'll see the blood cell. So try to identify the abnormalities here. So I think for the hematologic trainees, it will be very easy. So the question is, what is the most likely morphological diagnosis? So the options are anemia, chronic disease, Iron deficiency anemia, dead poisoning, C 
citroblastic anemia or thalassemia trait. So I think you may have come to the correct diagnosis. It is B, iron deficiency anemia. So we'll discuss from the beginning. So this young woman who comes with anemic symptoms following menorrhagia. So the examination only finding was fellow. And in the full blood count, white cell and differential, uh, total white cell count and the differential count are normal. And the hemoglobin is low, red cell count, hematocrit low, MCB, MCH, and MCH all low with elevated RDW and mild thrombocytosis. So here the red cell indices, all MCB, MCH, and MCHC are reduced. That means this is a hypochromic microcytic indices. And the the MCV and red cell count are reduced in relation to the degree of anemia. So this with this hyperchromic microcytic indices with elevated RDW, so from the full blood count itself, we can think mm, this is most probably iron deficiency anemia. However, for, to confirm it more morphologically, we can perform the blood picture. So here, so uh, you can see there's a anisopoikilocytosis where the cells of different sizes and shapes are there. And if you see the red cells, so you can compare the size with the lymphocytes to identify whether the cells are microcytic uh, or not. So the most of the cells, so the most of the cells are, uh, the, the size is smaller than the lymphocytes. So that means the cells are microcytic. And if you consider the chromasia, so the normal red cells, on only the one third of there is the central fallow area is around one third of the cell. But here, most of the cells, the central fallow area is exceeding two third of the cell. So that means these red cells are hypochromic and microcytic. And what are these cells? So these cells are pencil shaped cells. So there are occasional target cells also. So in the presence of anisopoikilocytosis, hypochromic microcytic red cells, pencil cells, and occasional target cells, the morphological diagnosis is iron deficiency anemia. So the next question, uh, again related to the same case scenario, which investigation you would perform to confirm your morphological diagnosis? A bone marrow examination, High performance liquid chromatography or HVLC, hemolytic screening, serum erythropoietin level, or serum ferritin. So I think it's easy because you already know the morphological diagnosis. So the answer is serum ferritin. So by serum ferritin, you can assess the iron status of the body. All the all other investigations are not relevant in this patient. And make sure when you are performing the serum ferritin, to avoid any acute illnesses like acute inflammatory infection or inflammatory status, because serum ferritin is an acute phase reactant. For, so the false positive results, that means the elevated results can be there when there's a, an infection. So in that case, you can perform iron studies, including serum iron, total iron binding capacity, and transferring saturation to confirm your morphological diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia. So let's move to the next. Prior to that, we'll see that more different types of uh, hypochromic microcytic anemia with morphology. So this uh, uh, indicates uh, from a patient with uh, citroblastic anemia, where you can appreciate marked and isopycrosis, <laughs> many triad of cells, elliptocytes, and irregularly contracted cells. So to confirm the diagnosis, you have to perform a bone marrow examination and demonstrate ring citroblast in the bone marrow with iron state. So this is a blood film from a patient with uh, lead poisoning where you can appreciate the vasophilic stiffening is there. So that is the uh, uh, main feature that differentiates lead poisoning. And this is a blood film from a patient with hemoglobinopathy carrier state or thalassemia tray. Again, you can see the anisopoikilocytosis and many target cells, irregular contracted cells, partial hemoglobinite cells are there. So to confirm the diagnosis, you need to perform HPLC or capillary electrophoresis. So this type is from a patient with anemia of chronic disease. So there are some uh, hypochromic microcytic cells along with normochromic normocytic cells. So there are other than that, uh, there are no much red cell changes. 
So uh, I think you can understand now the importance of blood picture in differentiating different types of hypochromic microscopic anemia. So this is the second case scenario. A 15-year-old boy with history of transcription dependent anemia who defaulted follow-up and lost records now admitted with anemic symptoms. He's pale, ictenic, and has hepatitis plenomic. His hemoglobin is 50 grams per liter. So you can come across this kind of patients in your course uh, and clinics. So this is the pre-transfusion blood film of this boy. See what are the abnormalities you can identify, especially with regard to the dead cell morphology. So then we have performed HPLC or high performance liquid chromatography from a free transfusion blood sample of this bone. So try to interpret this. So this is the confirmatory test for this condition. So the question is, what is the diagnosis of this bone? Is it alpha thalassemia major, beta thalassemia intermedia, beta thalassemia major, beta thalassemia tray, or else sickle cell anemia. So the diagnosis is beta thalassemia major. So we will see how we can come to the correct answer. So this is a boy with transfusion dependent anemia. It come in with hemoglobin of five. And this blood pill, so you can see the red cell morphology there is marked an isopoipirocytosis and also strikingly many nucleated red cells are there and also marked polychromasia also. And the red cells are hypochromic and microcytic and some irregularly contracted cells are there. So this is a uh, typical blood picture from a patient with thalassemia major. So when you see a blood picture like this, to confirm the diagnosis, you need to quantify and identify the types of hemoglobin the patient has. So we can perform HPLC for this patient. So this is the HPLC of this patient where the main hemoglobin percent is hemoglobin A, which comprises 95%. And the normal hemoglobin, that means HbA, is totally absent in this patient. And the HbA2 concentration is elevated. The normal level is three point, up to 3.5%, but this patient has 3.9%. So there are the elevation of HbF concentration markedly with elevated HbO2 and the absence of HbA, where the diagnosis can be made as beta thalassemia major. So if I talk about the other option, so the alpha thalassemia major is not consistent with life after the neonatal period. And beta thalassemia intermedia, we cannot take because it's not a transmission dependent anemia. And beta thalassemia tray, again, usually the patients are asymptomatic and do not require transitions. And the HPLC, uh, there's only mild elevation of the, uh, the HbA2 level, about 3.5, with mild reduction of the HbA level. And sickle cell anemia, again, in the blood picture, you will see sickle cells and also in HPLC, hemoglobin variant, hemoglobin HPS will be demonstrated. Uh, so the third case scenario, uh, this is a five-year-old boy who admitted with jaundice and fallow following a febrile illness over the preceding five days. So this is his full blood count. White cell count is 12.8 with hemoglobin of 41 and MCV of 104 and platelet count of 398. And serum bilirubin is 80, LDH is 520 and his direct antiglobulin test or POOMS test is positive for C3D alone. So we we'll see his blood pill. So this is his blood pill. Think whether you can identify the abnormality here. So the question is, what is the most likely diagnosis? Is it cold hemagglutinin disease? Is it hereditary spirocytosis? Is it glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency or G6PD deficiency? 
इसे पैरोक्सिस्मल कोल्ड हीमोग्लोबिन यूरिया और होम ऑटोइम्यून इम्यूनिटी केनिमिया तो व्हाट इज द मोस्ट लाइकली डायग्नोसिस सो द मोस्ट लाइकली डायग्नोसिस इज पैरोक्सिस्मल कोल्ड हीमोग्लोबिन यूरिया ओ पी सी ए so we will discuss from the beginning so this is a small child who comes with torn disc and fallow following febrile illness so most likely post viral uh, hemolytic anemia like picture and in the full blood count he has got severe anemia and the hemolytic markers are elevated including bilirubin and ldh and the direct antiglobulin test is positive that means this should be a autoimmune hemolytic anemia and it is all positive only for c3d so this is most likely to be a fall type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia so then you can move to the blood film so you can appreciate some spherocytes with red cell agglutinations are there but most striking abnormality is this so what is this so this is erythrophagocytosis where the neutrophils has engulfed the red cells so you can see the red cells within the neutrophils so erythrophagocytosis is uh, not a common finding in peripheral blood film and it is not unique for the pch as well but where if you find erythrophagocytosis in a peripheral blood film of a patient with cold type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia it suggests more towards paroxysmal cold hemoglobin urea and this pch is common in childhood and it can lead to severe intravascular hemolysis and severe anemia so these are the blood pictures of from uh, of the other options i have mentioned in the question so this blood film is from a patient with hereditary spherocytosis where the most of the cells are spherocytes and the other cells are polychromatic cells this the bluish colored cells are polychromatic cells so this is a typical blood picture from a patient with hereditary spherocytosis so what about this one so this is from a patient with d6pd deficient with evidence of oxidant induced skin lysis so there you can appreciate the blister cells so many blister cells are there and also some white cells also and this is from a patient with warm type autoimmune hemolytic anemia where again you can see many spherocytes and also polychromatic cells so sometimes it may be difficult to differentiate hereditary spherocytosis from warm type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia so in that situation you need to do chemical screening with blood films and also perform direct antiglobulin test so this blood film is from a patient with cold hemoglobin disease so it is very much evident that there are many red cell agglutinations throughout the blood film so it is very important to have blood film to identify the different types of hemolytic anemia as well so this is the fourth case scenario so it is a 39 year old previous healthy woman who presents with fever and acute onset mental confusion so this is a full blood count white cell count 9.8 hp 83 platelet 21 and her serum creatinine level is 125 so we will look at her blood film so this is it so try to identify the red cell abnormalities and any other abnormalities present in this blood film so the question is what is the most appropriate management so to know the appropriate management you know it to have a clinical diagnosis at this point so whether you going to arrange an urgent blood transfusion whether to arrange urgent thyroidosis to arrange urgent platelet transfusion or arrange urgent therapeutic plasma exchange or is it enough to involve close monitoring of vitals so what do you think the answer is so the answer is to arrange urgent therapeutic plasma exchange because this patient is most likely to have thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura or tpp so if i go to the beginning of the case scenario so this previous healthy woman comes with fever and acute onset mental confusion that means acute onset neurological impairment and in the full blood count he has anemia and severe thrombocytopenia and serum creatinine levels is mildly deranged 
In the black field, see there are many red cell fragments. So these are red cell fragments or cystocytes. Other than that, you can appreciate the significant polychromasia also. Many reticulocytes are there. And also the fake platelet count is markedly reduced. So only one or two platelets per page. So this is a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So along with thrombocytopenia, and the patient comes with acute onset neurological impairment with mildly delayed renal function. So the most likely clinical diagnosis is thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. So you need to arrange an urgent therapeutic plasma exchange, otherwise the mortality and morbidity will be high. This is a medical emergency. So what about the other options? So urgent blood transfusion and urgent dialysis are not required. And what about the platelet transfusion? So the platelet transfusions are contraindicated in TTP unless there is a clinically significant uh, bleeding, life-threatening bleeding. And the inward close monitoring of vitals is not adequate. We have to act promptly with urgent therapeutic plasma exchange. The fifth case scenario, a 23-year-old man presents with fever and dyspnea, and on examination, he appears pale and unwell. He has several bruises. So, so this is his full blood count, white cell 9.2 with neutrophil 0.7 and leukocyte 3.2 with hemoglobin 89 and platelet of 12. And this is his blood cell. So there are some large cells there, so try to identify what they are. So the question is, what is the most likely morphological diagnosis? Is it acute lymphoblastic leukemia, acute myeloid leukemia, chronic myeloid leukemia, high-grade lymphoma, or myelodysplastic syndrome? I think it's an easy question. So it's acute myeloid leukemia. So this uh, young man who comes with uh, fever and even anemic symptoms and several bruises, so the full blood count shows pancytopenia, then there's neutropenia, anemia, and severe thrombocytopenia. And in the blood film, there are these large cells with large nuclei. So these are blasts. So the nuclear pattern is, we call it as immature and all very open chromatin pattern. And also there are prominent nucleoli also. So other than that, the presence of the cytoplasmic inclusion. So it is our roads. So presence of our roads, we can morphologically diagnose as myeloblasts. So these are myeloblasts. Other than that, in the blood film, confirms the presence of severe thrombocytopenia. You cannot appreciate any platelets here. So the, in the presence of myeloblasts, the diagnosis is acute myeloid leukemia or AML. You need to confirm the diagnosis with immunophenotyping by flow cytometry and cytogen. So this is the sixth question and the last case scenario. A 45-year-old woman is incidentally detected to have an abnormal full blood count. Examination reveals phenomically. So this is the full blood count, white cell count 55, hemoglobin 110, and platelet of 600. And this is her black tail. It is obviously abnormal. So what are the abnormalities you can see? So the question is, what is the most likely morphological diagnosis? Bacterial infection, chronic myeloid leukemia, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, leukemoid reaction, or primary myelofibrosis. I think you could identify it correctly. So it is chronic myeloid leukemia or CML. So the patient was found to have this uh, abnormal full blood count, which has uh, leukocytosis with mild anemia and thrombocytosis, and she has splenomegaly also. And in the blood picture, I think you can appreciate there's a marked leukocytosis with full spectrum of granulocytic series can be seen in the peripheral blood. 
So there's mature neutrophils, band forms, metamyelocytes, myelocytes, and promyelocytes, and even blast stages can be seen even though it's not visible here. And also other significant thing is you can appreciate the, the peaks in mature neutrophils and myelocytes. So out of this granulocytic series, most of them are either mature neutrophils or myelocytes. And there's this eosinophilia along with eosinophilic precursors. So this uh, pink, uh, orange color uh, cytoplasmic granules. So these are eosinophil precursors. So with this background, so, so the most likely morphological diagnosis is TML or chronic myeloid leukemia. So it is important to differentiate leukemoid reaction from CML because the management is totally different. So in the leukemoid reaction also, you can see markedly elevated white cell count with left shift, but here there is mainly the band forms predominant and with some immature forms. And other than that, you can see toxic changes, including toxic granulation, neutrophil vacuolation, and dolly bodies also, which are not seen in CML. And the eosinophilia and basophilia are not seen in leukemic reaction. And the platelet plot can be variable, but the morphology is normal. In CML, usually the, the platelet shows large and giant forms with anisocytosis. The neutrophil alkaline phosphate S4 is elevated in lymphoimmune reaction, and in contrast, in CML, it's reduced. Splenomegaly is usually absent in leukemic reaction, and in CML, CML you can See moderate to massive sclerogen. And the genetic abnormality, BCR, ABL1 translocation is only detected in CML. So this is the karyotype of this patient where you can appreciate the reciprocal translocation between chromosome 9 and 22, forming the Philadelphia chromosome with BCR, ABL translocation at the chromosome. So with that, I have come to the end of the quiz. Hope you enjoyed it. And these are my references. And I would like to thank the Sri Lanka Medical Association and the Sri Lanka College of Hematologists for giving us this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam. Um, and now we are ready to take any questions. Um, if uh, if you have any questions, you can put them on the chat. And uh, if you, if there's any specific um, consultant or uh, lecturer today that you would like to uh, get the questions answered from, you can mention that as well. Or oh, please feel free to unmute your mic and uh, direct the question to us. Keep the chat on for another five minutes time before we end the meeting. So please direct your questions. Feel free to answer your mic and ask any questions directly or feel free to put them down in the chat.
Since we don't have any questions in the chat, uh, we will conclude uh, the monthly clinical meeting. Um, so once again, thank you all for patiently listening to the monthly clinical meeting in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of Hematologists. My sincere thanks to the College of Hematologists on behalf of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Uh, I'd like to mention our speakers once again, uh, Dr. Vasanti Vikramasinghe, Consultant Clinical Hematologist from the Teaching Hospital Mahamodara, Dr. Vajira Kamage, Consultant Clinical Hematologist from the Teaching Hospital Karapiti, and Dr. Utpala Nettikumara, Lecturer from the Department of Pathology and Forensic Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, University of Moratua. So thank you all for joining in online today, and um, many thanks once again to the Sri Lanka College of Hematologists, our speakers. We'll see you at the next monthly clinical meeting on 19th of March, 2024 with the Sri Lanka College of Nutrition Physicians. Until then, bye-bye. Have a pleasant month.